Hi, I'm Michael Smith. At Berkeley College, we're committed to educating the public about the importance of higher education and its impact on our communities. That's why we're proud to support the important educational programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by RWJ Barnabas Health, Berkeley College, the New Jersey Education Association, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, the law firm of Gibbons PC, NJ Best, New Jersey's 529 college savings plan, turn a dream into a degree. And by Adler Aphasia Center, helping stroke and brain injury survivors recover their speech. Promotional support provided by NJ.com, small news, big news, true Jersey. And by JerseyBites.com. This is one on one. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You got this? Here it is, man. Look at that. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> I don't care how good you are or how good you think you are, there is always something to learn. Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. Welcome to Minute Maid Park. Welcome to Miami All-Star Game. This is straight from what I think. Nobody's telling me what to say, how to say it, or anything like that. I am a guy making $30 million a year. Anybody who gives him more, you need your head examined. Dusty, get off the mound. They don't need you for crying out loud. You're a championship baseball team. You want to be part of that? We're trying to help you. And you let this ball drop. Dive! 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 You got to be kidding me. Uh, finally, finally, Chris Mad Dog Russo Steve. has come Good to, to public you television. How you doing? Uh, I am great. This is Chris Mad Dog Russo. You just saw him on uh, MLB Network High Heat. That's a show, but you also can check him out on Sirius XM, uh, host of Mad Dog Unleashed on the Mad Dog Sports Channel every day from 3 to 6. Love it. Got the radio and the TV, so I fly. I can do the TV every day at one, same studio, run down two doors down, same building, and I start the radio at 3 o'clock, so it's a good scenario for me. Chris, was this the career you envisioned? Uh, you know, I didn't, uh, Steve. I thought I was going to be a play-by-play -play guy in, in baseball, so I went to the winter meetings in 1982, right out of college, Rollins College in Florida, and I went to the winter meetings baseball that year, and they were in Hawaii. Mm. So I went out to Hawaii in December of 82, thinking that I was going to get a job in Major League Baseball as a play-by-play -play guy starting the minor leagues. And the job I ended up getting was in Jacksonville for the old Jacksonville Suns baseball team. Double A, Tom Seaver pitched there once. You know, Henry Aaron used to play in the ballpark. So I ended up in Jacksonville in early 83. Mm. Make a long story short, I ended up on radio shortly thereafter. But I thought I was going to be the next Vince Scully. And I wasn't. When does, timing on this, I'm trying to get this right, so you're in radio all that time. Right. Uh, F-A-N. Right, F-A-N in 89. 89. Right. Uh, I was in Jacksonville and Orlando between 83 and 87. Trying to get to New York there, uh, no, I not say? Necessarily, no, not necessarily, no. I really? was doing talk radio. I loved Orlando, Florida. I went to Rollins, so I got the school right. and the job scenario right there. Then I got a job at WMCA in New York. Uh, in 87, and the guy who hired me was Rick Scalar. Scalar promoted the first Beatles concert at Shea in 1965 and put Cosell in the air. There was an ad broadcasting magazine. If you talk like a New York sports fan and can deal with the New York sports teams, send tape and resume. I sent a tape and resume. They got 54 tapes. Sat there for five weeks. I got a phone call for St. Patty's Day weekend in 87 by Scalar. They hired me. Tripled my salary. Went from 18000 to 54000 And I came up to New York, and I started working in April of 1987. And uh, Francesa, Mike Francesa. A year and a half later. Mike and Mad Dog happens two years later. September of 89, we how, began. How many years? Uh, 19. By the way, check out our website at steveoutabato.org. We did a, when the, when the Mike and the Mad Dog documentary a 30 for 30 special came out on ESPN. Uh, who do we have? 
We had Ted Shaker. Ted, Ted. Oh, he Ted came in here. Yeah, yeah, that's oh, right. Excellent. I didn't know that. We have all of the, the important people. No, so, he, by the way, check out that documentary. It's great. No, they did a good what job. That's thirty for thirty. You? Uh, you know, Personally, I, what did you feel like? Anytime. First of all, it's ESPN, uh, so you know that adds a lot of credibility to it. Thirdly, it's an hour. Uh, and it's a radio talk show tandem. So you got a radio talk show tandem on a 30 for 30 on ESPN. Uh, I tell you, that was interesting. The one before us was the Celtics and the Lakers. Loved it. Multi-part series, three-part series, oh, fabulous. They did a great job. It was like six hours. And you're seeing promos Freeze. when Bird is winning an MVP award. And right out of that, there's a promo for Mike and the Mad Dog on the next 30 for 30. That is a lift. And you said what to yourself? I said, my God, I must have made it. Remember, <laughs> I followed the bird magic thing in Orlando doing right. sports talk in the 80s. I was doing radio down there. I love that rivalry. And here it is 20 years later, 30 years later, I'm sitting here watching the recap of that on a 30 for 30. And here's the Mike and the Mad Dog promo. So it meant a lot. Unbelievable. So that happens for more than a few years. You, make, yep. you make history. It's an extraordinary uh, must listen every day. You make the move to Sirius in oh, 2008. 2000, summer of 08. Oh, wait, how tough a decision? Uh, it was a hard call to make because you know I was leaving a, an, established, uh, <clears throat> an established show. I was leaving a guy that I had been with for two decades. I loved the radio station. Very, very tricky call to make. I just thought it was time to make it. Uh, Mel Carmerson, who uh, owns Sirius, uh, you know, I had a lot of respect for him and I had worked for him because he had owned, obviously, Infinity. So he owned FAN, which is an Infinity station. So from that perspective, I had comfort with him. He convinced me to do it. Uh, they pay me, and listen, the money was about equal, so everybody seems to think I ran over here. No, no, it wasn't, because I gave up the TV simulcast with right. Yes. People forget that. A yes uh, carried it, right? A yes carried it, and I got paid for that. No, 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 no. Separate. The separate? That's, That's awesome. a separate deal. The idea no, of no, no TV with the series. Chris, sorry for interrupting. The idea of being able to program your entire channel, you, you got that channel. For oh, wait, five years I did that, yeah. Five. Now, I haven't done it in the last five. That's a hard job. You know, I'm doing a show every day, and I'm also coming up with people to sort of help me along to put together a channel. That's tricky. You were in management. Yeah, it's hard, and I'm not a management guy. I Why think you learned that. Oh, you got to hire and fire. You got to listen to a lot of tapes. You got to make some difficult decisions. I mean, I want to just do a show. Well, I tell you what I didn't realize is I did five hours on Sirius, and five hours on Sirius without that many commercials is a very, very difficult order. It's like seven hours a day on terrestrial radio. Radio, and when I started, I didn't realize how hard that was gonna be. Just to establish a show on so you gotta establish a new show on a new format wow. without commercials, local or national, that's a major assignment right there. Then you throw in the management thing, almost became too much. What about the national thing? Going from <clears throat> being in New York, New Jersey, our metropolitan area, I mean, right. the guy right. with Francesa, you go to the, you're doing a whole national thing. Yeah, How it's, did it change? It's, it's tricky. Uh, you have to do a different kind of show because the people who are going to listen or call me are not going to break down, you know, what Terry Collins did in the eighth inning of a June game against the Mets of whether he should have or pinched Torrey it. Or Torrey at the Yankees. Or Joe Torrey at the time of the Yankees. They're not going to break that kind of stuff down. So you have to look for more of the big topics that right. can sell in Walla Walla, Washington. Now, you have a lot of New Yorkers who have Sirius. Remember, there's a lot of New Yorkers around the country who miss their local radio from New York, and so they buy Sirius, and there I am. So you got a lot of displaced New Yorkers listening, so there is a almost a Northeast feel to it, but it is a trickier show to do from a national standpoint. Obviously, a lot more college football. So there's some certain things you have to do. You gotta learn how to do it. It's tricky, and the, no commercials. You gotta learn how to pace the show a little differently. Chris, was it tough? I mean, for you as a hardcore Yankee fan. Uh, uh, yes, <laughs> facetiously, Steve says that. I do. Uh, I, I used to, as, when I listen to you every day here, I'm sitting there going, Chris is a hardcore San Francisco Giant fan. Right. And I want you to tell everyone, and you, you, and you actually, not that you don't like the Yankees, it's worse than that. I used to hate him a lot more, but go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> It's a question of degree. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm a hardcore, our, our president, Neil Shapiro, hardcore Yankee fan. Same here, what's your problem with the Yankees? Well, my problem with the Yankees really goes back to my father, who was a great teaser, and my father was a huge Yankee fan. DiMaggio, uh, even Garrick when he was eight years old, wow. but DiMaggio and Mantle. And when the Yankees got good in the mid-70s and won championships in 77, 78, won a pennant in 76. Reggie. I'm, Reggie, I'm 15, 16 years of age, 
My Giants are terrible, and he's tweaking me every day. And look, look what the Yankees did tonight. Look at this comeback against the Red Sox in 78. Look at Oscar Gamble and Jim Spencer and Thurman Munson, and I got annoyed by it. I think that's where my real Yankee really? hatred began. Really? That's it? Oh, he drove me crazy. It's really... You don't want to be with a winner? No, I don't know what it was. Me, I'm a rebel when it comes to sports. So I think the fact that my father was such a Yankee fan made me go against him overall. Then I got, then I have Mike. So oh, Francesca. I, I, who's like a big brother, who's as big a Yankee fan as my father used to be. Who they had I, a relationship. My, my father and Mike were close. Right. And Even then, when you guys weren't getting along, uh, they stay close. Uh, good boy. Right on. And then the Yankees win in 96, 97, 98, <laughs> right in the middle of Mike and, and the And a giant stick again. And you cannot be talking about McCovey and Mays because that time passed. Not exactly Who right. cared? Plus, the Giants are bad for a good part of this year, and the Yankees are winning championships. So I got it at a young, at a youthful age on one end, and then I get it from Mike when I'm in my career doing yeah. talk shows with him. So, and then I leave, and then the Giants get good and win three championships. So I'm not there to really have fun with it with Mike. Uh, Chris, when you were coming up and you are now the way you were then, you're you. Right, change. Did any agent, did any... Oh, absolutely. Did they say, Chris, you got to tone it down. Oh, absolutely. Seriously? Oh, gosh, yeah. I had a general manager in Orlando. This is probably in uh, 86. I had started, I had relatively successful that market, and he wanted me to get speech lessons. Stop. Because he thought I talked too fast. So I actually went to the Orange County Medical Center with a speech therapist. Making I probably it up. went twice a month, uh, twice a week for six months to see if Elocution? I could get my speech and all that. Fiction? Exactly. And, you know, I think work. it had some effect. I think it helped me a little bit. But as it turns out, I got to the right market because I went from Orlando. I didn't go to Orlando to, you know, the Albuquerque, New Mexico. Or Green Bay. Yeah, right. I went, or Chicago, a town that's Midwest, a little that's quieter. Right. I went Orlando to my hometown, which didn't have a problem with speed and the way I talked and pronunciations and everything else. And my lack of pronunciation, not having a good guide there, has actually helped me. Because it's made me more of a character, per se. But that and is people you. people like characters. And by the way, when you started to do Letterman, what year did you start doing David Letterman? Uh, 19, my first appearance there was February of 91. And you just were you? I was just me, yeah. He was a big listener. He and was. He, yeah. he wanted to make fun of me. So he used to make fun of me. You were the foil. They gave Donald Duck a show, which is great opening line. So I did Dave for a long time. I, I did Dave for a long I period of there. I loved doing that. Plug the MLB. Oh, operation. MLB, I love it. It's serious high heat. It's uh, MLB high heat every day at 1 o'clock. That's the best network in the world to work for. They let me, I tell you, most networks that are owned by the owners, right. NFL Network, NHL Network, you name it, you have to be somewhat careful because it's an owner scenario. This, owned by the owners, they let me say what I want. Now, I don't go absolutely nuts like I would on the radio. We saw the opening, though, Chris. You right. say... There you go. And by the way, we had Al Leiter on and with us. He what, worked with him as what well. What a great guy. He said the same thing. Best Nobody, place to No work. pressure. No pressure. They basically let you do what they want to do. And remember, editorial content for a talk show host, you know better than anybody, is everything. They got to let you be you. And the MLB Network has always let me be me, so give them all the credit in the world for that. So I do an hour show every day talking baseball, even in the wintertime, but mm -hmm. how bad can that be? How much, I, before I let you out of here, how much do you love your career and your life? Well, remember, the, the thing for us, you two, you made a hobby a career. 99% yeah. of the American public does not, is not able to make a hobby a career. I would be following sports anyway, so the fact that I've been able to do it for 30-something years as a living is a major, that's uh, a gift from God. And so God gave me this memory. It's almost like God put me on this earth in the mid-60s. I'm an only child. It's almost like sports is my friend. It's like my sibling. So I had this, and he gave me a memory. So you put that with a passion, and you know, I'm six years old, he created a talk show host. Mm -hmm. Make a long story short. All right, I'm not gonna say where Chris Summers, I'm sure, because people flock there, but you gotta see this guy run on the boardwalk. Oh, I love you too. I, Steve saw me for years on that boardwalk, running up and down, I, I to, I, and I, I finally, get, I, we finally got together doing a show know, I, together. I, I stopped Chris, he was running, because everybody's bothered. Hey, you gay man, dog. I said, Chris, he goes, yeah, what? I go, it's me, Steve Alright. He goes, who? No, so, I, yeah, you did. Did you I did. say that? Yeah, I no, apologize. No. And I That's said, a bad job. You gotta come do our show. And he goes, what, what, what show? And finally, 10 years later, that's all it took. That's all it took. Hey, you know what? Thanks Great to have that. you with us. Thank you for having me on. Appreciate it. This is Chris Mad Dog Russo, every day, Sirius XM. Uh, 3 to 6 at high heat, 1 o'clock, uh, Monday through Friday on the MLB Network. They let us plug it, people. There you go. That's the Mad Dog. We'll be right back right after this. 
to watch more One on One with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. We're talking to United States Senator Chuck Schumer. The senator has just toured and there's a group of people here at the ICP Museum. This exhibit, Then They Came For Me, Incarceration of Japanese Americans During World War II. Senator, you saw this first in Chicago, this exhibit. What moved you so much and why are you so moved again today? Well, um, first, these are fine people, immigrants, children, grandchildren of immigrants. They looked a little different, maybe had different last names, but they were as American as any one of us. And yet, during a very dark period of our history, we took them out of their homes, out of their jobs, out of their schools, out of their livelihoods, and put them in camps. And the pictures are so moving because, you know, to use the cliche, a picture is worth a thousand words. You can read about it, but seeing the pictures of these young people, that picture that I saw in Chicago. Yeah, that one. I saw you paying attention to it, Senator, yeah, because, on that train. Because it's all these fine people being put in cars, railroad cars, to be moved to camps. It just brings home what we were doing. And, you know, with what's happening right now with the Dreamers and with immigration and that um, certain wing of politicians led by President Trump mm -hmm. tend to want to make immigrants, not tend, want to make immigrants as scapegoats mm -hmm. and people who look different and might have different last names. Mm -hmm. That's a dark, dark side of America that when you see pictures like this, it makes you want to fight mm -hmm. it every, with every atom of your being. And that's how I feel. You know, put, to put things in perspective, we're talking about 120 Americans. Thousand. Well, excuse me, 120,000, thank you, Senator, uh, Americans, Japanese Americans, taken from their homes, taken from their businesses. And when they, for several years, and then, Senator, when they came back, what was there for them? And by the way, after Pearl Harbor, this is when it started. Yeah. When they came back, what was there? Well, their, their jobs were gone, their livelihoods were gone, their structures were gone. But these, like almost every immigrant, were resilient people, and they came back and became good Americans once again. And when you read about them and talk to them, some are bitter, but most just have moved forward with mm -hmm. their lives, glad to be part of America once again. So, Senator, for those who say, you know, it's for national security, that's what we did then in the 40s, and we need to do that again now with a different group of people, what Let's do you say to no those folks? Let's make no mistake about it, in both cases, and particularly now, that's a total excuse. These are some of the fine, the dreamers and the immigrants that we have in America uh, are by and large some of the finest people that we have. They work hard. They just want to be part of the American dream. And that is what's made America great, whether it was in the 40s or today or way back when, you know, in 1892 sure. when my ancestors came here. My middle name is Ellis, Ellis Island. My daughter's middle name is Emma named by my wife and I for Emma Lazarus, the poet who wrote Give Me Statue Your Time on the Statue right. of Liberty. So I have believed in immigration right. my whole life, I think both for humane reasons but for economic reasons. Right. And th what they're doing now is just so, so yeah. un-American, it curdles your stomach. By the way, you see the senator talking to other people here. There is a large group of people gathered here at the ICP Museum. and these photographs, and you'll, you'll see it throughout the segment we're doing here, they're extraordinary. Some great artists, great photographers. Why they, oh, they does that allowed. stand out, though? This what is do you some, mean? Well, there's an artist named Mr. Miyataka. He was a photographer. Now, they didn't allow pictures in the camps, because they were ashamed. They didn't want anyone to see they it. They didn't want anyone the to see it. The federal government, you mean. That's correct. But he took those pictures, and a good number of them are here. So are pictures by Ansel Adams and some of the other great photographers. So it's a beautiful photography exhibit, but the meaning is, is deeper than that. So, so for those, and by the way, for our public television audience and others who are watching this interview with Senator Schumer, who are getting a sense of these pictures, what is the biggest lesson that you, and more importantly, Senator, because you already got the lesson, that other Americans who may not even see this exhibit but want to know about it, what should they take away from this? What they should take away, number one, is how important we are as a melting pot of people of all different backgrounds, all different uh, places, religions, races, creeds, colors, come to America and want to be Americans and are great Americans. Second, that when people use them as scapegoats, as political footballs, we have to fight back and fight back and fight back because America can 
uh, we are still a country where if you fight back and appeal to the better angels of our nature, we can succeed. So finally, Senator, um, by the way, I want to thank you for joining us. And the Senator will be joining my colleague, Raphael Puerman, in another segment down the road to talk, if you will, the issues like the Gateway Tunnel and let's call it the drama going on in Washington. That's another conversation. That's a different issue. But, yeah. but the final question is this. For those Americans who say, we need to protect ourselves from, quote, them, your final message to those folks. Them is us. Those people are us, whether it's uh, Irish immigrants who were discriminated against 150 years ago. My family Italian ago, is from Naples. Italians or Jews or Poles, uh, Hispanics now, Asians now. Uh, America wins when we are united, when we welcome people from abroad. And you know, every immigrant is special. Could have had no money, no mm -hmm. education, but they had the gumption, the desire to say, I want to make a better life for myself. I'm going to risk sometimes uh, crossing deserts or oceans. Mm -hmm. um, I am going to settle in a whole new country because I want to make a better life for me and my children. Every immigrant special. In fact, the name, then they came for me, is so appropriate given what Senator Schumer just said. So, Senator, I want to thank you and, and the crowd that has gathered here at the ICP Museum. Um, we we can don't you normally. Tell them where it is. Yeah, by the way, the ICP, I want to make sure everyone Please knows. Please, everyone knows so you can come. 250 Bowery, New York, Lower Manhattan. It is extraordinary. It's a powerful Where's exhibit. That? The senator um, saw it first in Chicago. Sweet, it's so thrilling that it's here in New York. Make it your business to come check it out. One more time, I want to thank you, thank Senator. You. Thanks Appreciate so much. It. Thank everyone here as well. Thank you, everybody. To see more one on one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are at the Liberty Science Center in beautiful Jersey City. I'm here with my colleague, Joanna Gagas, uh, the anchor of Life and Living. Uh, and why don't we introduce our very special guest? Yes, we have Carolyn Welsh, who is the VP and Chief Clinical Officer at the New Jersey Sharing Network. Carolyn, thanks for being here. Talk to us a little bit about what you're doing, because you're working very much behind the scenes, a job that no one really sees, right? Yes. A lot of people don't know that this exists. And if you're someone that's waiting for an organ transplant, you want the New Jersey Sharing Network and you want the Sharing Network clinical team on your side. We are there every day working very, very hard to make sure that we could save as many lives as we can. So I have a team of over 100 people that work every day to save and enhance lives through organ and tissue donation. Well, I'll tell you, I mean, this is the 30th anniversary gala of the New Jersey Sharing Network. It's an extraordinary organization, but it's interesting. Joanna and I have been to several of the 5Ks, right? You see thousands of people at those races, but what's interesting is behind the scenes, behind the very public events and the public awareness campaign that we've been involved in regarding organ and tissue donation, a lot goes on behind the scenes, as you were just telling my colleague Joanna. Yes, absolutely. So we are there from the start of when someone has an untimely uh, death and they call from the hospital to our call center. That's 24 hours, seven days a week with people there uh, every day. And they take the call and determine medical suitability. And then we send specialized trained people to speak to potential donor families to see if they had designated their wishes or if their family would like to say yes to donation and save someone's life with that generous gift. And Carolyn, we know that when that decision is made, it doesn't end there. There are support services for those family members. Talk about those services and why they're so important. Yes, we have a dedicated family services team and they take care for families like coming up soon. We have a grief support coming up before the holidays. A lot of times the families before their first holiday of losing a loved one, it's very, very difficult. So we have them come to our office and see how we remember their loved ones and we never forget them. How do you Most, do that? I'm sorry for interrupting. Oh, okay. How do you actually do that? Yeah, um, we put a group together and try to limit it to a small group so that if they want the group support, they can, but then we do individualized care as well. Um, we help them to write letters back and forth to donor, donor families and recipients so that they can have that connection. Some choose to meet, some don't want to meet. So we really are specialized to offer what's right for that person and that family. Carolyn, finally, what would you say to all the folks watching right now on a variety of uh, media and content platforms? 
about the whole question of organ and tissue donation. And people say, oh, well, I guess we're good. We have what we need. Uh, but there are so many people waiting, and I know we say this all the time, but make that clear to folks. Yes. So desperate, desperate need for those that are waiting. And I think the biggest message is that this could be any one of us on any side of this equation. Any one of us could have a tragic accident and be asked about donation, and any one of us could get sick with a virus. This is not just long-term terminal illness that causes the need for an organ transplant. So remembering that it could be any one of us. And I think the way the world is right now, this is one thing that crosses all race, gender, ethnicity, religion, culture. Um, and it's just an amazing thing. You see the best of the world and the worst of the world all at once. So sign up, be an organ donor, talk to your family, and say yes to the gift of life. Well, finally, on behalf of my uh, talented colleague, Joanna Gagas, and all of us in the world of public broadcasting, Fios, and everyone who is a part of the Caucus Educational Corporation, we want to say happy 30th, right, Joanna? Absolutely, happy 30th, and thank you for the work that you do every day. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET Studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by RWJ Barnabas Health, Berkeley College, the New Jersey Education Association, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, the law firm of Gibbons PC, NJ Best, and by Adler Aphasia Center. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. I'm Taiwan Join, Berkeley College, class of 2011, Assistant General Manager, Vera Wang. Kate Hickey, class of 2006, Project Manager at Tricarico Architecture and Design. Sal Frasina, class of 2009, Chief Construction Inspector, Con Edison. Tracy Mondale, class of 2010, Sales Space Manager, PepsiCo. From different walks of life, our students succeed in different ways, yet their first step is exactly the same, Berkeley College.